This is episode 266 of Jumble Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview amazing people about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. On today's show, our guests are Kim and Todd Saxton. More about them in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, you can check out every episode of Jumble Think in podcast form wherever you listen to podcasts. You can check it out on Apple Podcasts by simply going to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. And for those of you who like the good old-fashioned radio, you can check us out at jumblethink.com slash podcasts and find the full list of 17 cities you can listen to us on the radio. Now let's go ahead and jump into today's show with Kim and Todd Saxton. Hey there, welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have an incredible show lined up for you today. Before we get rolling, we want to take a moment and thank a couple people sponsoring today's show. Our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com are doing something really cool. They've launched a new program called North American TEFL. They are helping people get the certificate that they need to teach English as a foreign language. Most major embassies issuing work visas and employers across the world, they require this certification so that you can teach English abroad. So head on over NorthAmericanTEFL.com to learn more about how you can get your certification through their program. We also want to thank our friends over at Penji, your source for unlimited graphic design at a low monthly rate. They are offering our listeners 15% off your first month simply by going to Penji, P-E-N-J-I dot C-O, that's dot C-O, not dot com, and use the code JUMBLE, J-U-M-B-L-E, to get 15% off your first month. We have a super cool show lined up for you today. Our guests are the husband and wife team of Kim and Todd Saxton. Dr. Kim Saxton has over 30 years of marketing and market research experience working with large corporations, startups, and medium-sized businesses. Currently, she teaches marketing at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. And her husband is Dr. Todd Saxton, associate professor and Indiana Venture Faculty Fellow at the IU Kelly School of Business. They have written a new book. It is called The Titanic Effect. You see, most startup books tell founders how to create their new venture. Instead, The Titanic Effect actually tells those businesses what to avoid. If you remember, The Titanic is an iconic tale of what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. But while the iceberg may have represented the killing blow, what many don't realize is that the demise of the Titanic was a result of a series of small decisions and missteps across a number of dimensions. Well, their book, The Titanic Effect, goes into the icebergs of business and how you can avoid them and set your business up for success. We're going to have a great conversation, so let's go ahead and join our conversation with Todd and Kim Saxton. Our guests today are Kim and Todd Saxton. Super cool to have you on the show. Thanks so much for taking time out. Thank you, Mike. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm big fans of the topic. I'm, I love that you guys are looking at the whole concept of the world of startups because I think most universities that I talk to, they talk a lot about corporate business. You know, That's your MBAs and all that. They talk about small business, but there's not a lot for the last several years coming out a lot about startups. And I love that you guys are focused on that. Thanks. We enjoy it. I know that you are teachers. I know that you have written this book. Tell us a little bit about the journey of finding, for Kim, you, you teach marketing and for Todd, your management. So tell us that journey of getting to those places of being a teacher and then discovering the world of startups and really wanting to influence that space. Well, I'll jump in because I think uh, in some ways, the question I think you are sort of asking is, how does a marketing professor want to write a book about startups? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's like this. Indiana University is a research university, meaning that you know we have to do research on businesses. And in order to do research on businesses, we have to be involved with those businesses. And uh, we started doing outreach in the community. Todd started probably 22 years ago. Oh, wow. And I- 
I started 15 when I went back to start teaching and we just have a very vibrant uh, startup community here and they weren't really that well connected to universities. And so we just started jumping in and doing things and um, helping companies get started, uh, advising companies, rolling up our sleeves, doing some of the work at companies so we can learn kind of the latest issues on the ground. And then we started to see some pretty common mistakes being made. Okay. And when you start giving the same advice for the third or fourth time, you think, hey, wait a minute, maybe we ought to tell people more about this. And so this book is really aimed at entrepreneurs, uh, first time entrepreneurs, early stage startups. And it's about all the things that you make choices about early on that you don't really understand the ramifications of all the consequences because you can't because it's super uncertain that then later we see cause cause constraints and those constraints sometimes can be fatal. I want to step back here for a second. One of the stats that I saw on your website was that 70% of all startups fail. And uh, it's easy to say that a startup is any business, but that's not really true. So how are you quantifying what a startup is versus maybe a small business or different kinds of places versus an entrepreneurial journey and the startup world? Yeah, it's a great question and one that uh, is very much an academic question in the research we do as well, uh, because what is the the start of the life of a startup, right? Is yeah. it when you first incorporate? Is it your first sale? Is it when you first put up a website? Or is it when the uh, the fabled light bulb goes off and you have the idea. Uh, and that, that 70% number is pretty well documented over decades of research uh, looking at startups and, and startups that eventually fail. 70% uh, is about at the nine to 10 year mark. Uh, at five years, it's about uh, 50%. And what, what we feel is that if anything, that underrepresents all of the ideas that never actually get off the ground because right. that seventy percent is starting with you know some kind of uh, flag in the ground, typically date of incorporation, uh, and there are a lot of great ideas and great founders out there with with cool ideas that never even get to that point that they're they're kind of still uh, on the napkin in the closet if if you will. Yeah, the the one day syndrome. I have an idea, I have a dream, but one day I'll get to it, or one day I'll take that risk, or when I have enough money saved up. To, to kind of hedge my bets on on stepping out into this unknown. Yeah. It's really sad. I, I, that's one of the areas that we feel at Jumble think that is one of the saddest, are the people that never take the risk to even step out. But I think a lot of that is because of the fear of the unknown, the fear of what if it fails or not even knowing where to start. And, you know, part of entrepreneurship is that it's typically this – this uh, entrepreneurs are known for being starters. They start lots of different things and some run successful businesses. Are these patterns that you talk about in the book, the, the hangups, the obstacles that these businesses face, are they things that people learn along the way or do most people don't even realize that they're still making those mistakes? <laughs> I would say there's a real continuum there. Okay. Uh, it, it's funny. One of the major what we call debt bergs, so one of the, the icebergs that people run into and in what we call the human ocean, we put this all in the metaphor of the Titanic and seas and oceans and try to weave in a nautical theme uh, because of the, the essential task of the entrepreneur is navigating uncertainty, uh, and that is across a number of dimensions. Uh, but even very seasoned entrepreneurs, one of the mistakes they make is allocating equity equally at the start of uh, what is a very long journey. So uh, again, local tech entrepreneur that we know who's launched many companies, raised tens of millions of dollars, and we were talking about this inequitable equity debt berg when you know three or four or five people sit around the table and you know drinking beers or having coffee and come up with an idea and they go, hey, all right, we each own you know twenty percent, all five of us, uh, and and it almost never plays out that everybody contributes equally, right. but you're kind of stuck with that and and you have to intervene and have a very uncomfortable conversation to extract yourself from that. So. Uh, some of these kind of mistakes or, or pitfalls are things that I think people do continue to make. What we try and do is offer some suggestions 
in the book for ways around it. So part of it is awareness that you might be creating this this debt burden, uh, but also part of it is navigation. What do you do to avoid it, uh, or what are some ways to to kind of address those those challenges? Hopefully, what the book does is raise awareness to, as Kim was suggesting, the earlier entrepreneur or or perhaps first time or less experienced. Uh, that may, might be systematically making these mistakes across a number of, of domains or dimensions and not even be recognizing it at the time. Now, is this what you're, you call technical debt? Well, I, we got the idea started from the concept of technical debt. And um, one of our, uh, our, co- our third co-author, Michael Cloran, um, is a serial entrepreneur in the software space. And um, he was doing a presentation explaining to one of our classes about um, their approach to software development and how it tries to minimize technical debt. And Todd and I looked at each other and we're like, wait a minute, technical debt is not the only problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ben Horowitz even mentions it. He says, you know, management debt. And we're like, well, it's not just management debt. It's employee debt. It's marketing debt. I mean, there's other places that you're picking up debt without realizing that you're picking up debt. So when I think of So technical debt, for those who don't know, is that, you know, you make early choices in how you build your software or design a product that later on you can't iterate around. And so you have to scrap all the base code and start from scratch. One of the things that we see in the whole, um, well, let's say there's a a common practice now of the pivot. Mm -hmm. And what sometimes people don't realize is that every time you pivot, you're basically throwing away the existing customer base. Wow. And so that's a debt. You just spent money, you know, creating a database of potential customers, and then you change to be something that isn't what they signed up for. And so you don't get to count them anymore. You get to flush them. Wow. Well, can you make those pivots and still retain some of that? Is there a difference between like a pivot per se in the early stages of a startup and an evolution of an idea where you're able to have consistency of thought or consistency of forward motion because it sounds like a pivot is almost like a hard stop like hey we got here now we're going to derail what we've done is there a way to navigate that so that you don't have that technical debt as you learn because i mean when you go into a startup world i i've experienced this my own life i've i've worked with hundreds of of, of business owners and entrepreneurs uh, in the, the the tech space in silicon valley and an idea at the earliest stages there's a lot of unknowns. There are things that, of course, you know, things that you know you have to know. And then there are things that you just don't know until you get into it. So is there a way to navigate that technical and other forms of debt to minimize the pivot so that's not hitting that core base of your base? Yeah. So, you know, that product market fit is the biggest challenge. We all know that. And it takes much longer than people think it does. And, and I, you know, some people say, well, what you got to do is go out there and fail fast. And, and we would say, instead, what you need to do is be very smart about your experiments so that you can turn a direction fast, Learn right? fast. Learn fast, yeah. not fail fast. Yeah. So one of the most extreme examples, and Todd will remember the exact application um, for an algae uh, that they made a huge pivot. I don't know how they could make this. So it started as a fuel additive uh, that was going to supplement and you know cleaner glass, uh, gas, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, a year later, they were a food additive that uh, <laughs> now very well documented benefits, but the disconnect as either investors, uh, which we were potential investors, or, or as a customer, to think about something that you could put in your car and all of a sudden you're saying, actually, just put it in your body, is a little disconcerting at best. So, uh, yes, startups do have to pivot. Uh, what what we observed, though, and, and have seen, especially with the advent of kind of the lean startup and, and agile planning, uh, is that this pivoting almost becomes like a random pinball experience as opposed to systematic experimentation. Uh, And and that's what we think bridges that gap between a sensible pivot and an intelligent pivot versus a random journey. To do that, you would have to be intentional about the decisions you're making. And and I think a lot of the tech space, which is the space I work most with, uh, the pivots often are emotionally filled or there's a failure. So we've got to do something else. We can't continue this course. You said, you know, leveraging the, the the learning, the, the information that you have, the, the experiments that you're running, what does that successfully look like in 
the space of entrepreneurship because I think a lot of people go, okay, that's cool, but I have no idea how that would even work. So this is where I think a lot of startups could use a little more effective planning. You know, you could say, well, how does a marketing professor get up into startups? And I could flip it around and say that most startup problems are marketing problems. Yeah. Of course, she's a marketing professor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's being smart about the customer. And so and just doing a little bit more work about the customer before you really leap into it. You know, we, we see too often that people will have an idea. They go and ask a few people and those people usually are friends and those friends say, hey, that's a great idea. You should roll with that. But when you actually go and talk to real customers, first you have to stop and think, I can't go after every single customer. So which set of customers, we call them segments, needs this the most? And then you have to have some hypotheses segment a b c or d okay and now you go after segment a and you test it out and see you know is this what they want um and not just is this what they want but what do they think is this benefit and if you kind of start there and then you say okay i really really want segment a so do i need to change the benefit do i need to change the product or no segment a is not interested in this product or this benefit at all let's see if segment b is so it's it's about being systematic and thoughtful and too often what i see is people put something together and kind of throw it on the market and hope that somebody picks it up and then the first person that picks it up they go oh that's who wants it and they run after that and then the second person picks it up they go oh no no this is they want it and and they run after that well you're just always running you're not being thoughtful does that make sense? Yeah, completely, completely. So I want to back up for a second. We were, we were talking about technical debt, and then we kind of moved into uh, using experiments and information to guide the pivots so that you do educated pivots versus reactional pivots. Technical debt, though, isn't always uh, – when we think of debt, we put it in a financial context, but – Technical debt could be the the consequence of a decision versus necessarily a dollar to dollar exchange. It sounds like absolutely, and and thank you because that is the basic thesis of the book is that these hidden debts are kind of below the surface. They're not financial, but they are constraints, they are expectations, they are obligations, uh, and they place some some limiters uh, on the the trajectory of the startup. And and again. Uh, can actually sink it if if not managed appropriately. And they could also have financial consequences. So like we talked in marketing debt, you know, if you take a major pivot into a, a new product, a new segment uh, that's very different, you're going to have to spend the money in marketing that you already spent again. Yeah. And, yeah. and in human debt, I mean, one of the examples we give in the book that's pretty well known, if you don't get the legal relationships between partners set out, um, it's also going to eventually end up costing you money. And, and the classic example is um, a Cliff Bar, uh, that there was on paper a 50-50 owner of Cliff Bar. And um, when they got an offer, uh, he had to buy the second person out to the tune of $60 million. Wow. Well, wow. so there was definitely a consequence to that to that decision that was a financial but probably – slowed them down in the ethos of what they're creating, maybe being able to make decisions and respond to the future that they want to build. Sounds like that there was many costs to that decision of partners. And I, I think I've been shy personally with my own business about bringing partners in because I know that there are benefits to having partners, but there are also potential pitfalls. And I know a lot of partnerships that have not ended well. And so for me, I've shied away from bringing other people into what we build. And other than employees or contractors, you, you mentioned the word hidden debt. And, and we're going a little bit further into the to the to the layers of this. I mean, I guess the Titanic, the iceberg kind of thing, there are, there are depth to consequences and to choices and to, to these debt decisions. As an early startup founder you know, 15 years ago or 13 years ago for myself, I didn't know a lot. I just was, I had an idea. I was pretty good at something. I just kind of jumped into it. What are the things that we can be doing to remove the unknowns and start discovering the hidden debt before we even get into the journey? Well, first of all, congratulations both for taking the leap and, and doing so well with it. Uh, and that's, uh, hopefully, what the entrepreneurial journey should look like, although I'm sure you hit some icebergs and had some bruises along the way. Yeah, for sure. But uh, so, again, if you think about, and I think 
one of the challenges that, that we see teaching entrepreneurship and, and working with entrepreneurs is they kind of think that once you get over that hump of, for example, product market fit, uh, and you nail that, that you're reducing uncertainty or, or what some investors call kind of de-risking. Uh, so if you envision like this curve, it's like you start with a really high level of risk and then over time it goes down and down and down and down. Uh, what we are trying to convey is that the entrepreneurial journey is a, a, a constant journey of systematically navigating different icebergs or, or debtbergs. Uh, we characterize them in terms of these four oceans. So we've mentioned technical and talked about that. There's the human ocean. Those are your co-founders, your investors and advisors, your employees. There's the, the marketing ocean uh, with, with the people you choose to sell to, the value proposition and how you actually deliver that, uh, the technical and then the strategy ocean, which is kind of the underpinning that, that links all of those together. And if you think about the, the stages of growth, so first, if you think about just kind of the ideation phase. I've, I've got an idea. Is it the right idea? How do I test that? Who do I test that with? The next stage becomes moving toward an MVP and actually getting a minimally viable but functional working design in the hands of some customers to kind of see what happens. Then you move into kind of your first customers, your, your launch and, and early growth. And then hopefully you get to the point where you're you're actually scaling and and building a, a, a substantial organization. And at each of those stages, you your uncertainties kind of vary. Uh, it's the same basic structure: human, technical, marketing, and strategy. But the uncertainty evolves as as you move forward. Uh, so what what we hope the concepts of the book do is to kind of lay out that journey for for the entrepreneur and the supporter of startups to kind of better understand what that journey might look like, anticipate at least some of those, and recognize the trade-offs and the decisions. I, I wanted to come back to pivoting. Uh, we are not saying that pivoting is bad, uh, and, and I want to make sure that was clear. Pivoting in many cases is a necessary part of the journey. Just recognize the hidden debts that you do incur every time you pivot, and again, do it, do it systematically and, and with intention uh, as opposed to in random fashion. Yeah, you're you I think said it well earlier when you said there's a difference between reactionary pivots and educated pivots where you know what you're doing from the standpoint of you know the cost, you know uh the outcome, you know the data. So you never can really re eliminate uncertainties. It's just that what you're uncertain about evolves and changes. And early on, it's about who are you working with? Who are you talking to? What are the basics of this product design, whether it's software or something else? And then as it gets further, it becomes in investors and employees and uh, really ramping up and scaling sales and marketing. There still ends up you know, being uh, debtbergs that are hiding out there. We're going to pause here in the conversation uh, as we're getting close to the end of this first segment. I'm going to ask the questions we always ask everyone as we wrap up this first segment. The first question is, this is really important work. As a, a founder, as an entrepreneur, uh, myself, I see huge amounts of, of, of value in what you're talking about and what the book talks about. Thank but you. for you personally, how are you finding purpose in what you do? Well, that, which you just said, and, and the classic I like to give. So <laughs> the first time we presented, the way we got to a book is we presented this at a local venture um, community event, and someone goes, oh, my gosh, this needs to be a book. And so we were kind of dumbstruck, and we thought, oh, that's a completely different way for us to, as teachers <laughs> to do something, but why don't we try that? And and trust me, we've got our own bruises now. Um, <laughs> it, it, writing a book is a lot like starting a company. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Any interesting parallels. But you know what happens is even in those first times we did it, someone would say, where were you when? Which is like, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, I didn't know this mistake was coming. But as uh, people have been reading the book, they email us. And so uh, someone who was actually uh, a, a member of our wedding party, uh, we hadn't talked to for maybe 15 years, got the book, uh, read it on most of it on the plane, sent us an email immediately afterwards. I've been in startups for the last 15 years of my life oh my gosh, I cannot believe the mistakes we've made. Thank you. You gave me the words to have a conversation with my co-founders. That's so, our, our purpose. Yeah. As, as educators, uh, hearing those stories and, and getting uh, that kind of feedback that this is, this is actually helping people make better decisions or more informed decisions 
Uh, and by the way, they seem to enjoy reading the book too. It's it's not a textbook, and we we try and weave in some some storytelling, and we had fun writing it, and and hopefully uh, people will have fun reading it as well. But uh, learning something and and feeling like they're better able to realize their own entrepreneurial dream, uh, that's that's uh, that's what we're looking for. Typically, we would ask, "What is one challenge you're currently working to overcome in your business?" In this case. I, I want to ask it this way, maybe. Uh, what is one challenge you're currently working to overcome in sharing this message? Creating awareness is hard. As a marketing professor, you know, I, I know that. <laughs> um, you know, you see, and it's this is the same problem that startups have. Big existing companies, you know, demand all the attention and drive up the price points at which you can get other people's attention. So I mean, that's really hard at the early stages for anybody to get the word out. And that's why we're doing these podcasts. Um, it's just us, you know, marketing it. We don't have a whole PR firm or um, – uh, our publisher isn't one of the big name houses that, you know, can just get the book everywhere. So we're trying to, you know, drive pull demand for the book. And then our final question for the segment is what is the big goal you have for this message? I would say, again, it, it's uh, kind of educating, helping entrepreneurs make better decisions, realize their own entrepreneurial dreams. But but also, uh, aside from the founders and the entrepreneurs, uh, and, and you're a good example because you are one, but you are also in that network and, and helping a lot of others. Uh, and I think if if some of this language and, and some of these concepts uh, we can translate to people who have their own network and their own ability to affect decisions in that network and and help entrepreneurs, uh, we can we can have that kind of uh, ripple effect, uh, if you will, that extends far beyond our own network. And that's what was exciting to us in terms of thinking through. As professors, rather than having a captive audience in the classroom <laughs> who needs a grade, you know, people have to actually go and pay money and read this for because they think it's going to be of value to them. Uh, and and so moving from a one to twenty, one to sixty, uh, where again they're the students are a captive market to thinking about this getting in the hands of people who we don't know, who don't have to be reading it, who don't have a, a grade attached to it. Uh, but still get value? And then how do we get it in the hands of influencers who can, again, use these concepts and help their networks so that uh, we, we see, uh, you know, kind of um, our, our impact, at least indirectly, uh, is, is considerably magnified in that way. So uh, I would say that's the big goal or, or, or dream for uh, what we hope in however long it takes, five years, 10 years, that uh, uh, – that, that we're, we're helping entrepreneurs into the future and in other areas than our own immediate network. Well, we're going to take a break right here, and we will be back with Kim and Todd Saxton to talk about uh, their book and much, much more. Today's show is brought to you by Penji and North American TEFL.com. Here's a little bit more about North American TEFL.com. Did you just graduate from university and are not sure what step to take next? Or maybe you are looking for an exciting career transition. If you are interested in exploring the world while still earning income, you can teach English as a foreign language in one of dozens of countries across the world. From China to Colombia to Japan and beyond, there are opportunities for you. However, the majority of embassies issuing work visas and employers in the educational field require teachers to earn a certification in teaching English as a foreign language. For more information on how you can travel the world as a teacher, see new exciting places, and even build a career, visit NorthAmericanTEFL.com. That's www.NorthAmericanTEFL.com. We also want to thank our friends over at Penji for sponsoring today's show. Penji helps startups, agencies, small businesses, big businesses, and marketing teams achieve more with unlimited graphic design support at one flat monthly rate. Their easy-to-use online platform pairs you with a professional designer and lets you create as many design projects as you want. Think of it as your monthly subscription to top-notch design. No contracts, no hourly billing, just fast, simple, and affordable graphic design for all of your needs. And for our listeners here at JumboThink, they are giving 15% off your first month when you visit penji.co and use the code JUMBLE. 
Again, head on over to Penji, P-E-N-J-I dot C-O, and use the code JUMBLE to get 15% off your first month. Now let's jump back into our conversation with Todd and Kim Saxton. We are back with Kim and Todd Saxton. All right, there's a significant question we've got to ask right here, and that's, there are going to be people listening. They're going to want to know how they can find the book, how they can connect with you. So what are the best ways to find, connect, and get the book? Yeah, so um, the book is available on most of the online resale, uh, retailers and um, some Barnes & Noble's uh, bookstores. But we also have a website, uh, www.titanicaffect.com. Uh, we do a weekly blog, and so you can subscribe, and you'll see ideas that we're sharing as we are – uh, working with companies and pulling some ideas out of the book, but also some very current things. Um, we actually did set up a special page for uh, the Jumble Think listeners. So uh, www.titanicaffect.com slash jumble. And there's some special resources available for them. Um, but you can also email us through the website. Uh, we are doing a bunch of speaking engagements and workshops. Um, we've got a couple with some co-working locations where we're going to roll up our sleeves and work together to identify Debtbergs already existing in some startups. But we love connecting with, uh, with entrepreneurs anywhere and everywhere. So reach out to us on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is tsaxton at IU, as in Indiana University, dot edu. And Kim is mksaxton at iu.edu. Uh, feel free to reach out directly. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll put those links in the episode notes. So if you're listening, you know where to head. Head on over to jumblethink.com. You can click those links. It'll take you right to where you can connect. And I am super excited about continuing this conversation. As I said before we wrapped up the last segment, I, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a person that's worked with hundreds of businesses myself uh, through our agency and through uh, consulting with different organizations, I know that these are important conversations that we just aren't having enough of in business spaces and in entrepreneurial spaces because I hear the same pain points uh, over and over again, the, the ones that you're sharing about the four oceans, the technology behind it, the strategy behind it, the human uh, and the, the employee oceans. I wonder what is the biggest area or hurdle that especially early startups, people who are new to this, this space, what's one of the biggest hurdles that they aren't aware of that they should be approaching and saying, you know what, I'm going to be prepared for this and I'm not going to hit this ocean or I'm not going to hit this, this stage of my startup without being aware of what I'm going to face here. Well, I would say there's two big ones. Todd's going to talk about one in the human ocean, and I'll talk about one that goes between the technical and the marketing ocean. So in the, the human, and we talked a little bit about this, but uh, this challenge where a group of, of founders, uh, two, three, whatever we, we call it in the book, the curse of thirdsies, uh, three founders sit around and, and come up and, and allocate all the equity, uh, and then six months later, uh, one of them has gotten a new job offer, uh, has had a baby, you know, just a variety of things. Life gets in the way, uh, but that al equity has already been allocated. Uh, so we do offer a couple suggestions there. But I would say to those entrepreneurs, uh, allocate equity very slowly and, and deliberately. Uh, if you think about it, you're probably at the point that you have a, a something on the back of a napkin and you have an idea you're maybe three or four percent of the way through the journey. So to allocate 100 percent of what it might eventually be worth uh, is, is very premature. So allocate that slowly and, and use something I'm sure you're familiar with called vesting, uh, where you actually earn the equity that you are expecting to get over time, maybe even a three to five year period based on contribution and based on milestones. Uh, that makes the conversation a lot easier. So uh, don't allocate all the equity and make sure you're vesting it over time. Those are two of the largest uh, debt birds that we see, particularly first-time founders early on uh, making in the human ocean. Well, I, I want to ask a little bit of a deeper question there. Uh, that's cool, but how do you do that? Because uh, is it basically that there's a percentage of equity that's just floating in limbo until it's eaten up by – 
uh, vested interest into the business or, or how do you navigate some of the structures of the, around that? Because it's like, Hey, we're going to give you 10%, 10%, 10% to start out with. And then over the course of four years, we're going to do this kind of vested structure that allows us to have VC money or angel fund come in and have a certain percentage. And it's not eating at our actual individual percentages, but then, so how do you navigate that? Cause that sounds like a very complicated thing to do. Um, it's it's actually relatively easy, and uh, as you move forward, uh, most ventures will will form what's called an operating agreement, which kind of lays out the specifics. Uh, what I like to do with entrepreneurial teams that I work with is to actually start with more of a term sheet. So that's a it's not legally binding, but it's basically a two to three page document that lays out the kind of buckets uh, that that talk about how much time everyone's going to allocate. What are the metrics that earn contribution? What are the relative kind of areas of focus? Who makes what kinds of decisions? And who has decision-making authority? Uh, equity and decision-making authority can be decoupled. Uh, so it's really important. Uh, and, and even if you have, for example, two founders and they split 50-50 uh, the equity, you should have one that has uh, majority decision-making authority uh, so that you don't have this even split. That was the challenge that Kim referred to with Cliff Bar uh, was 50-50, and one of those 50s <laughs> wanted to sell for $120 million and, and the other didn't. Uh, so it was, it was kind of an irreconcilable challenge. Um, at a minimum, most operating agreements will have a set-aside pool, so that's uh, roughly maybe 20% on average uh, that you just set aside, so you're only allocating 70 to 80% of the equity uh, even when you have the operating agreement and are making some traction, recognizing that you're probably going to have to add some additional members to the founding team and you want to have equity set aside or at least options for them. Uh, that, that actually makes it a lot easier when it comes to that decision of, hey, we really need a VP of sales and marketing. Everybody pony up and, and you know donate 5% <laughs> of your equity. That's a much harder decision. That puts people in the mindset of loss framing, what they're giving up. Uh, if you already have that pool set aside and you can say, hey, we need a VP of sales and marketing, and guess what? We already have this uh, 20%. We're going to take 15% of that and allocate it to our new VP of sales and marketing. It's not coming out of anybody's pocket, uh, and it's viewed in, in kind of game framing, which is a much more positive way that, that uh, people make decisions. That's super cool. That's really, really helpful. And then on the flip side, you said the other ocean that's really kind of a big one uh, for especially early startups is marketing. So Kim, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the, the challenge is, uh, and we sometimes see this happen with startups, they're a solution in search of a problem instead of really starting with a customer problem. And the reason why that's so important is that people don't really like to change their behavior. Um, and a lot of behavior is already really well set. And so what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to provide value. And if you read some books on entrepreneurship and startups, they'll say you have to provide, uh, provide 10 times the value of existing um, solutions or maybe five times the value of existing solutions. I don't think we know how much more value you need to provide. The key is you have to be able to provide some value, and that value has to be worth paying for, which means – doing a lot more customer research before you really get too far down the line. And what we've seen some people do is they have this solution and they actually spend the money to build it out technically. And then they discover, you know, that nobody wants it. I'll give you an example. So we had some students who wanted to, um, you know, the, this whole meal prep thing is, is hot. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a cook and I can make, you know, 10 uh, servings and I only need five. So I'll, we'll build an app so that people can share their extra supplies with others. Well, I mean, to building that app is like $150,000. So we said, hey, why don't you just do that on an Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> get your friends together, <laughs> put it up as a Google Doc, get everybody to agree who's going to trade. And, and guess how many people traded? Hardly any. Zero. Zero. Okay. You know? I was being gracious there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that's why I say it's, it's – I think what happens is people are afraid to get bad news. Instead, they should embrace bad news. Get all the bad feedback. Get somebody to tear this idea down. Um, and then systematically figure out, all right, what's the real nugget in here? Because too many times we see things that, you know, really – don't have enough value to be worth changing your behavior for or worth paying for. 
you know, for me, for me, as uh, for the last several years, we've owned a web agency, and we've built a lot of technical startup platforms. The 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 software behind it. And it amazes me how often somebody comes in and goes, we need this, we need this, we need this. And I'm like, well, what does your audience want? And they go, well, I don't know. It's just, this is the idea. <laughs> exactly. And uh, a good friend of ours says uh, the audience is always the hero. And we forget the hero in entrepreneurship so much because we make it about us. We make it about our idea. So where at that point do you go the idea – is something that I'm, I'm good at. Maybe I'm passion filled, but the audience doesn't want the, the customer doesn't want. So how do we navigate that? Because that that's really personal for a lot of people to say, I don't want my idea to fail. I don't want my dream to fail. But in that process, there's some kind of disconnect from really engaging with the people that they're trying to connect with. And maybe there is a product or a service or a message that they could be creating, but they're missing it because they're so uh, – you wrote an article about this actually in your blog. It was talking about being focused versus closed-minded. So I guess the question is so often we're hi- highly focused on our ideas, our dreams, our, our, our what we want to do that we actually aren't focused. We're actually closed-minded. So where is that line in that and how can people navigate that so they feel like they're just still really – creating what they're, they're, they're passionate about, what their dream is, but that it can do it in a way that's sustainable. Yeah. So we have a couple of ideas in the book and some of these are from the technical part and some are from the um, marketing ocean as well, because this is one of those that kind of goes in both areas. Um, so um, we had this experience ourselves. We actually bought a ongoing a business that was already here in Indianapolis in Indiana, central Indiana. Um, and I'll be honest, it made cakes that were wine cakes. So a cake mix that already had wine embedded in it so that when you added wine, all of a sudden, you know, it tastes really luscious and it made it a lot simpler. And we were like, well, this is cool. They've been selling X volume and they wanted to retire and we bought it. And our idea was to put it online. Um, And what they were doing is going around to gift shows and having people taste it. So then we actually did some market research, some objective market research where we just asked people, what do you think about this concept? Turns out that Indiana is the worst state in the United States to sell this product. (laughs) And in fact, we sold more in Montana than we did in Indiana from the website. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, And so you just have to ask yourself some hard questions. I mean, in this case, it's a cake mix. So the freight is expensive. So you really want to be able to deliver it locally. (laughs) Um, So do you invest in building knowledge? I mean, most people were not aware of it. They never heard of it, never occurred to them this could be interesting. In California, Sue, oh, yeah, we'd love that. So, I mean, then you make your choices. We chose to shutter the business um, because it just wasn't a distribution channel we wanted to work with. So you've got to, A, actually do some objective market research with the intended audience, not just your friends. The second thing you could do is you could ask yourself, sometimes people call it a thought experiment, um, why has this never been done before? Mm. Right, and envision all the reasons why it's never been done before and then ask yourself well is this now the time for this to have changed okay the third thing you could do is you could look for analogs one of the things we did in the book is we plumbed startup graveyards and autopsies and looked to see you know what caused failures has your idea already failed uh why and then again has has the time changed just doing more and, and the next blog post I'm going to write is about looking for analogies um, and how useful that can be. And then competitor research. I can't tell you how many times people say, well, we're the only ones. And then I just go do a quick Google search. And I start with like four, you know, yeah. and, and being the only ones is actually a very lonely place to be. Yes. If you've ever been in the middle of a blue ocean, uh, there aren't a lot of islands or ships around. <laughs> so it better be a darn good swimmer. Yeah. Uh, but, Mike, I, I wanted to come back to another element of what you were kind of hinting at uh, related to kind of passion and what an entrepreneur can do. And I think in a lot of the cases that at least we see, those entrepreneurs have in their mind that being a successful entrepreneur means going out and raising angel funding and eventually VC dollars and having a multi-million dollar valuation and scaling and, you know, all those, quote, sexy things that, that people talk about. But you can be a very successful entrepreneur by solving an important problem to a very small set of folks. So if you have a problem that you're very passionate about and you're not connecting, 
maybe you haven't found your tribe yet, or maybe your tribe's a lot smaller, but if, if your passion is less about a successful, scalable organization and more about solving a problem for, for like-minded people, uh, th there's nothing wrong, there's no shame in saying, well, I guess this isn't going to be a multi-million dollar, but if I can solve this problem and instead do it uh, as a free service or, or package it in a different way uh, and, and, and still affect the kind of change that I'm looking to do. Um, and, you know, to some degree, our book, we're, we're, we're obviously, hopefully uh, it's coming across, we're fairly passionate about the, this content and, and the challenges. We are not going to make money on this book. Um, and, and that is really not our objective is to, you know, be a New York Times bestseller or, or sell hundreds of thousands of copies or anything. Um, but we set our expectations, uh, I, I hopefully appropriately, in terms of how this might work and who this might affect. Uh, so, again, if, if what you're really passionate about is the idea, uh, then scale back expectations of what success looks like. Well, I think that that's one of the things of entrepreneurship that gets distorted very early and very often. Uh, there are people that say if you don't have an exit plan from day one, then you're not actually an entrepreneur. I've heard the conversation that says if you don't meet a certain market cap or a certain percentage of, of the, the space that you own – uh, then you're not successful. And, and I think that that's the thing about entrepreneurship that we need to step back and really look at is success isn't about what the world around us tells us it should look like. It's about defining what the, the win is for your, yourself. If you're an yeah. entrepreneur and you come in, like in the case of writing this book, you go, well, New York Times bestseller, probably not on our list of things, but you know that the value you want to bring is the success that you have. And so if you can get that message out, it's successful. If you are solving a problem that only impacts a certain segment and it's a small niche, you might not have a, a unicorn billion dollar valuation, but you go, we're making huge impact and we're creating great revenue to sustain and grow our family. So stepping back and really defining that success, when, when we look at failures of startups, how much of the failure, or, or maybe a better way to say this is, when we start out, how should we be defining success so that we know the end game of where we want to go. Well, one in the book we and Todd already laid out like the four stages of yeah. a venture. And I would say if you can get from one stage to the next stage, you should celebrate those wins. Because as he mentioned, like the losses are high in the first four years. It, some people say it takes like seven years to get to product market fix. I don't know if that's right or not. But you know, having money and keeping the lights on and moving forward forward progress, not backwards progress, um, I think are huge things to celebrate. You know, I've done a little bit of consulting work with some other smaller companies. So there's a local company here is about $10 million in revenue when I first started working with them, but it's owned by two people. You know, honestly, if you're generating $10 million <laughs> worth of revenue. <laughs> I mean, more power to you. I mean, yeah. you're, you're building something, you're employing people and, and they were, launching new products and just trying to figure out how to make them more successful. So, I mean, there was nothing but upside. Um, so I think everybody has to define their own success. And one of the other blog posts we wrote, and I think is really important to remind people too, is you need to know what metrics are important to you um, mm -hmm. because you tend to design programs that will make you successful on those metrics. And you also tend to win on those metrics. So think about what those metrics are because then you'll go accomplish them. As we wrap up this segment, look back at the beginning of our conversation. We, we threw out that number, 70% of all startups fail. There's a lot more talk about startups. There's a lot more talk about entrepreneurship. There's a lot more talk about being a business owner than I think I can remember my entire uh, life uh, in the last like 10 years. We're just seeing exponentially people talking about this as an avenue of, of – uh, in a lifestyle for them. You mentioned that there is a lot of data around startups and failure uh, and what that looks like. Are we making any headway in setting startups for up for success? Unfortunately, I would say the short answer is no, uh, not yet. 
Um, but but hopefully we're moving in the right di direction. I think there is a lot more recognition now of the role of the ecosystem uh, and, and building a critical mass of like-minded folks who can work with each other. And, and a lot of areas now outside of Boston and Silicon Valley uh, are starting to get that uh, and invest in the ecosystem uh, of support. Uh, and hopefully over time that will translate to a broader view of what a successful entrepreneur looks like. If you're an accountant or a doctor or healthcare provider uh, or in finance, that might just mean self-employment, that you're able to you know, kind of leave the, the corporate grind, if that's what you want to do, and find enough gigs to keep yourself employed. And the gig economy, I, I think, reflects. And, and in many ways, people who engage in that gig economy uh, are entrepreneurs, right? They're, they're trying, yeah. they're, they're having to cover a lot of different facets. So I think broadening our perspective, and, and you were uh, talking a lot about this as well, uh, in terms of how we define success, what, uh, what successful or valuable entrepreneurship looks like, uh, it's an incredibly important part of our overall economy uh, and, and also certainly very important to, uh, to the individuals involved. Um, I think universities are getting better at providing some experiential education in the entrepreneurship area and connecting. Uh, we certainly in, at Kelly have a lot of programs uh, trying to connect our students to the venture community so they get uh, some of that direct experience of, of seeing the icebergs that startups run into uh, and can also be an asset to those startups. Uh, so I think those are things that, that prepare people uh, for the entrepreneurial life or, and, and I say this frequently, but probably 20 to 30% of the students that engage in those product projects came in thinking they wanted to be entrepreneurs and leave the project going, holy cow, <laughs> there's no freaking way uh, I can do that or want to do that. And that is good, right? That yeah. they didn't have to leave their day job and take a second mortgage and uh, you know and, and take the leap to learn that hard lesson. They they got that kind of experience. So I think there is a role that that a, a variety of types of education can play uh, to kind of help entrepreneurs recognize and move forward on the journey successfully. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction. But uh, uh, unfortunately, and and in terms of the number of startups, I think it is kind of top of mind and in, in some uh, circles, you know, entrepreneurs are even kind of the rock stars, whereas 20 or 30 years ago, it was like, what, you couldn't get a real job? <laughs> um, but I don't think that's that's true anymore. And I think it's, it's much more celebrated, much more discussed. But the actual level of uh, number of startups uh, actually declined uh, through, I think about two years ago, right. has started to bump back up a little bit. Now, part of that is the economy. Uh, we have virtually full employment and and uh, there's a lot of opportunity cost to leaving a, a good paying job. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of facets related to that. And it gets back to, uh, as, as you were talking about earlier, uh, those kind of closet would be entrepreneurs that, that never actually launch because of the, the uncertainty, because of the unknown, and, and in some cases, even fear. Uh, and hopefully by, by raising awareness of these icebergs, uh, we actually demystify it a little bit and make people have better uh, kind of expectations about the journey, not that it isn't hard, not that it isn't uh, fraught with the potential icebergs, but uh, that it, it is navigable, and, and we have examples of that. Well, we're going to take a break right here, and in a moment, we're going to be back for rapid fire questions. We would love to be friends with you on your favorite social media channel, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. We are there. How can you find us? Head on over to jumblethink.com, and you'll find links to all of our social media channels. Then head on over to your favorite and click that magical follow or like button. So let's be friends, and let's dream together. Now it's time for Rapid Fire Questions with Kim and Todd Saxton. We are back with Kim and Todd Saxton. All right. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? Yes. Yes. All right. As a child, what did you want to do when you grew up? Well, we were debating the answer to this question earlier. I'm not sure either one of us had incredible dreams about what we were going to be. I think both of us have been more the type to like look at the opportunities in front of us and think about what do we want to do next. 
I will say at one point in time, I did have a dream to be the first female president of the United States. And I've now discovered uh, about the time I was about 20 that meant that sounded like a horrible job. <laughs> That's probably very fair. <laughs> so. I, I more knew what I didn't want, and that was a t- typical desk job. What is one tip you give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? One of the things we didn't mention is that we all – both trained for Ironman triathlon and we've completed, oh. Todd's completed four and I finished one, but started the line on, on a second one. And I, I would say the same thing to someone who thinks, what you did an Ironman triathlon. That's like 140 miles in 17 hours. You know, it's the first step. Mm-hmm. It, you don't have to tackle, you don't have to swallow the whole cow, like just figure out the first thing to do, do it and then figure out the next best thing to do and do that. And shameless plug, the first step is buying our book. <laughs> what is one big lie about entrepreneurship you'd like to break? That it, it it's easy. I mean, I, sometimes I hear people say, oh, I'm just going to go be an entrepreneur. Uh, tell me what idea I should have. Look, it's, it's really hard. It's not sexy. Um, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of late nights. It's a lot of worrying. And so you got to be ready for it. And I would, the one I would say is that uh, this visual of the light bulb and this idea that that it's the light bulb going off and and that's what entrepreneurship is. Uh, it's a long journey uh, and it's seldom kind of an instantaneous light bulb goes off and you have that uh, eureka moment. Uh, it's 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 a slog at times. What is one change you'd like to see in the world? We are concerned, and we probably talk about this a, a lot among ourselves. Um, about the culture of outrage that we see right now in the United Mm. States. And I mean, we easily fall prey to it too, but it starts like many cultures at the top. And when you create a culture of outrage, everybody's looking for ways to be angered and, and mad. And uh, we'd like to just see that calm down. What do you want your legacy to be? I think it's that in, uh, again, five to 10 years that, that we've uh, helped contribute to entrepreneurs realizing their dream and, a smaller rate, actually hitting those those icebergs and sinking. Where do you find inspiration? Yeah, so uh, the United States is kind of known as being uh, one who rallies around the underdog. And, and that's what I find inspiring is when I see people who have come from nothing and accomplish things. And, and there's other people who have been given things and don't accomplish things. And I just look at others and say, wow, they've done that. So, so can I. And people who want to affect positive change, innovators of any type, whether entrepreneurs or or in a larger setting, uh, I find a lot of inspiration in in what they're trying to do and and trying to see what we can do to help them. What is one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read? Oh, come on. That's a softball. (laughs) (laughs) The Titanic Effect, of course. Absolutely. I have have two others, though. Uh, Stephen Johnson's uh, How We Got to Now, Six Innovations That Changed the World, is a, a fascinating look back on some of the major things, including glass and, and refrigeration and, and things that have contributed to where we are. And it's a great kind of tale of the diffusion of innovation and how that works. Uh, the other is Daniel Pink's Drive, uh, which I think really helps us understand human behavior and what motivates people. And it's not always dollars and extrinsic rewards. Uh, and, and part of entrepreneurship, as Kim talked early on about, is is changing behavior. And if you better understand why people do what they do, uh, I think you can, can better affect change. We talked about this earlier, but I want you to define for yourselves how you define success. Yeah, I have to admit that we've adopted this from a podcast by Naval uh, where he said that wealth, and we use success instead, is basically having the ability to do whatever you want. Which is different than being rich, right? And, and that's the contrast, being rich versus being wealthy. Yes, absolutely. What is one trend you're currently excited about? Uh, I actually, uh, this is going to get fairly vertical specific, um, but I'm excited about the use of data in making better healthcare decisions, both for ourselves, but also for care teams. And I think we're finally moving from capturing information in personal health records to actually leveraging that information in positive ways to uh, better diagnose and, and treat and, and change behavior in healthcare. You know, as professors, we are scientists first, and I for sure am a researcher. So it's been my mantra that we should use data to make better decisions and I, that we are actually finally getting access to data that we can do that just excites me. What is one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? We struggled with this one in advance. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know. We are, are so diverse that uh, it's hard to say what our habits are. I mean, one habit we have, I think people should do, and, and we did this very early on in our our uh, our romance and even um, uh, marriage, is uh, take time for yourself. Mm. So, um, you know, we like every day, we would like to get out and get a workout. That's our time for ourselves. It, it doesn't happen as uh, all the time, but it happens a lot. But what one thing we used to do is we used to have pizza, beer, and movie night, and we'd agree to be home at a certain time, and there's no work. It's just pizza, beer, and movie night. We'd make a pizza, watch a movie, and just relax. Unplug. Take time to unplug for yourself. Yeah. Love that. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? In some ways, I wish I would have known how hard it was going to be to write a book with three people. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, I'm not sure we would have taken it on if we knew how hard it was going to be. And I'm really glad that we completed the journey. So uh, that would be one. Uh, one thing I've learned over time is that it's not really about the idea you have. It's about the way you communicate that idea. And mm. I, that was a very tough lesson I got to learn. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Well, broadly, if I weren't doing some kind of teaching, I'd probably be a ski bum somewhere, maybe Crested Butte, Colorado. Um, but uh, I, if I were not in my current role, professor, et cetera, uh, I could see myself in some other teaching role, uh, whether that's through consulting, corporate training, uh, educating at a, a younger age. Uh, I, I think that is one thing I always knew I wanted to be was some kind of teacher and, uh, come from a, a line of them, uh, both of my parents and, and, uh, so I, I can't see myself getting outside of some teaching role. So if I were a ski bum, I'd probably be a ski instructor. And um, I did take five years to go back between my PhD and now and uh, go into the corporate world. And I would tell you that I was the kind of manager who was a teacher first, a coach first, and uh, still really connected to my team um, and helping them. And so, again, some type of teaching role seems to be innate in us. And our final rapid fire question is, what is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? So we started making uh, a different kind of bucket list about four or five years ago, and that is instead of places we want to go, and there's still plenty of those, it's people that we'd really like to meet. Oh, okay. uh, some of them are actually dead, um, but it's like if you could put together your, your dream list of people to uh, just sit down and have you know coffee with or, or lunch or something and hear more about their journey, uh, I, I think uh, – and. I haven't done a good job both capturing that and moving that forward. So that's one dream that I want to move on. And mine is related and it's about experiences. I mean, we started thinking we had the uh, pleasure of having a sabbatical in Australia and we got to Thailand and New Zealand uh, back in 2007. We started looking at the world through the eyes of experiences. And so we've got a list of experiences we'd still like to have. Super, super cool. As we wrap up today's show, we always like to leave our guest or guests in this case uh, have a final thought. So what's your final thought for all of us listening today? I would say keep navigating. It's about the journey. And I say, get started. Stop waiting. Just go get it. We should probably reverse that order. Kim says get started, and I say keep navigating. How's that? <laughs> love it. Love it. Well, Kim, Todd, thank you so much for being on. If you're listening right now and you are an entrepreneur, this is a book that needs to be on your bookshelf right now, that needs to be read. So many great pieces of wisdom and insight. Uh, I... I can't speak highly enough about it so go check this book out and uh kim todd thank you so much for taking time out and being with us today thank you it's been great yep thanks once again we want to thank dr kim and dr todd saxton for taking time out to be on the show with us today go check out their book it is super powerful especially if you're an entrepreneur in the early stages of starting out we also want to thank our sponsors for today's show, Penji, who can help you with unlimited graphic design at a low monthly subscription. Use the code JUMBLE at Penji.co to get 15% off your first month. And we also want to thank NorthAmericanTEFL.com. If you want to get that certificate so you can teach English abroad, they are the place to go check out NorthAmericanTEFL.com. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to JumbleThink wherever you listen to podcasts. Now it's your turn. Get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous 
serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.